All right. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Um, as everybody knows, the layoffs are hit the tech sector and they're hitting them pretty severely. Um, I was reading a statistic today that since uh, November, there has been over 64,000 layoffs in the technology sector. Wow. And it's actually, when you look at how things are impacting people on H-1B visas, they have 60 days to get another employer or their visa. Right, they're screwed. Mm -hmm. um, then we also have... Uh, yeah, you know, the other issues of, you know, once you lay off, where do you go? What do you do? Mm -hmm. um, I know Roger and I, we've both gone through this a few times in our career. Um, I spent the year on the bench once. It was a very relaxing year, but you know, <laughs> when I when I ran out of money, it was time I've got to get to, back to work. Uh huh. <laughs> uh, but one thing that I found that has always uh, helped me was I continue to write and blog. Yep, excellent. I, I continued sharpening my tools, continued learning new things, writing, go to any conference or any networking event that I could. Mm -hmm. But one, one of the things, Roger, and what I was really interested in is... You are have focused on the performance of the database, but also with that performance, you can look at this uh, how the statistics are run, how the database is built, and the data models, and how the DBA or developer can become the uh, the citizen scientist. Mm -hmm. and actually mm -hmm. start providing value to the uh, your employer before they wind up mm -hmm. you know, cutting you loose, you know, show you're valuable to the employer. You know, we talked the other day about the million dollar query. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Uh, you're talking about the, the million dollar query or just analytics in general and, or leveraging analytics into the job sort of uh, description let, let's start with analytics in general, and then we can go into the million dollar query. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, I did put together a few slides on this, but just- uh, Yeah, I give, think you have a, the- uh... Yep, uh, just to give a little bit of a background, uh, you know, my field currently is, you know, Oracle database performance, and there are real, literally tens of thousands of metrics that are collected uh, by the automated workload repository. Uh, really, every in in some cases, uh, the, my current uh, client uh, every ten minutes. So so we're getting tens of thousands of metrics on the database collected every ten minutes, and it always bothered me that I was really only using maybe like. I don't know if it's me. I don't know if it's me, Roger, or you, but one of us is breaking up. Let me look at my internet. Okay, let me try the headset because it right. might be just the the mic's not picking it up. Okay. Get the mic in or get the headset in. Wondering if that came out any better. Oh, that's a whole lot better. Okay, good. Yeah, speak. I guess the mics on these computers aren't very good. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, just the idea of only using a, a dozen or so of the metrics that are collected every 10 minutes, you know, bothered me. You know, I'm thinking to myself, how can I solve any arbitrary performance problem? And I had to sort of get into bigger methods than I was using, because I called that the small model approach, you know, where you just handpick your metrics. Uh, whereas if you start getting into data science and big data type of techniques, then you can expand your analysis to these tens of thousands of metrics uh, and, and uh, you know, leverage those capabilities. And, uh, you know, part of it was uh, uh, my oldest son was getting his PhD in operations research, which is essentially advanced mathematics or analytics, that type of thing. Um, so he gave me a few ideas and I just ran with it and uh, you can actually do this in SQL. So I have a few slides here and, and one of the, I do talk a little bit about uh, the, the analytics angle on dealing with uh, 
analytics, because I do think that uh, we are faced with a number of challenges as software engineers and uh, database administrators, because there is some consequences that come with uh, big data <clears throat> and then also staying relevant as technology changes. You know, I've, when, um, when I first started uh, in the software field, I was doing Fortran programming and PL SQL or PLCS programming, that type of thing. So uh, technology is going to change out from underneath you. So you need to stay relevant. But in, just in terms of big data, obviously many companies are moving to the cloud and there's a lot of drivers uh, for that. Uh, DBA tasks are being automated. So some of the things that you were doing essentially are going away and, and moving to other support structures. Um, and then obviously new sets of tools uh, with the cloud as well. <clears throat> Uh, and there's also more opportunities in your businesses to use and analyze data. So I think that that's a big, a big driver for uh, picking up some skills uh, in that area. And of course, uh, the, the roles uh, are becoming much more data centric. So a lot of DBAs are, are focusing on understanding the data models of the applications that they're working on and st instead of just understanding Oracle and how Oracle works per se. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the roles and the and the roles that companies are hiring in are are very data centric. Uh, in terms of uh, staying relevant, then you know growing your analytical skills as the business changes. And one of the examples that I, you know, sort of incorporated into my own field was trying to pick up the data science approaches and the big data approaches. And since my field was performance database performance problem solving, then that is sort of the area where I have domain expertise. And I was just, uh, again, using those uh, methods applying to the problem domain that I'm working in. And the, and you could also, you know, apply this to the problem domain of your business. So if your business is finance, understand those data models and, uh, and what kind of approaches you can use to help solving those kinds of problems. Uh, and then, of course, you want to maybe, uh, you know, think laterally, how am I going to apply these new skills to other areas and experiment? So one example of an area that I looked in was, well, how can I use the analytics approaches to do uh, database health checks? Uh, so it just requires some uh, lateral thinking, but there, it definitely helps to stay relevant as technology changes. And uh, there are some analytical trends and of course the complexity and number of variables that we're processing, this is always uh, increasing. Um, and especially when you're talking about, uh, you know, pulling in uh, data from uh, the internet, you know, clickstream data, that type of thing, internet of things. Um, but this requires a new type of analysis, you know, might require machine learning, artificial intelligence, natural language processing. Uh, to do that. That's a trend in analytics. And then, of course, a lot of <clears throat> uh, databases are moving away from structured data. So your typical relational database is highly structured and uh, moving more towards uh, JSON data structures or other data structures that aren't um, as uh, requirement heavy in terms of uh, wh what is the description of the data ahead of time. And then in those cases, then the analysis defines uh, new relationships in the data. So that becomes really interesting. Uh, companies are investing in non-technology enablers as well, which is just uh, data literacy among their people. You know, how do you understand data? How do you understand the uh, data uh, techniques for using data? And then also storytelling. So what, what kind of story do you tell uh, with the data? So in the, in the case of performance problem solving, we're looking for root cause to the problem. Uh, and then also what kind of solutions apply. So then you have to put, you know, once you find the root cause, it's a little bit easier to find the root cause than to find the solution <laughs> because that uh, there's a lot more understanding of the problem domain and solution sets that you can use, uh, that type of thing. But uh, definitely data storytelling. And if your problem domain, let's say finance or some other um, uh, business, then uh, that would be a different kind of story. And of course, we need to uh, consider the data privacy and ethics because, yeah, you know, once you start getting into uh, data that's generated by people, you know, you get into those areas as well, you know, privacy and ethics. But uh, overall, there's just more opportunities to use and analyze data nowadays. And even for a DBA or a developer, I would say. So if you're just a developer, I would say learn and know and understand uh, the data. 
and uh, start playing with it, practice and see if there's things that you can do and bring forth, you know, and, and Rob asked the question about the million dollar query. And uh, when I was with a pharma company, uh, there was a guy who was a, a very good Oracle or SQL programmer. He knew SQL very well. He knew the database and the data structure very well. And he also knew the kind of problems that the business was trying to solve. Uh, so he literally wrote the million dollar query. And, and by doing so, he was able to uncover areas uh, where the company was not uh, collecting money that they should be collecting. And it wasn't built into the software package that they were using. And it wasn't built into the, you know, the application itself, but the data was there and he knew how to get it. And he literally wrote the, the million dollar, you know, the query that saved the company. It was definitely, it was over a million dollars. <laughs> um, so it can be interesting in that, res in that respect as well. And of course, uh, Rob mentioned the citizen data scientists. This chart comes from Gartner, and they're basically saying that uh, citizen data scientist is on the rise. And what that means is you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily trained in uh, data science uh, per se, uh, but you're, you have the domain uh, expertise. So I say a data rich culture rather than data driven culture, because the data, the data is there and we're not necessarily driven by data, uh, but uh, often, uh, decisions should be driven by data. Uh, of course, again, as I said, the, the citizen data scientist has the domain expertise and uh, and what makes it it's exciting for companies is that they're uh, ne not necessarily coming from computer science field or something like that, but they're coming from adjacent uh, disciplines. And of course, the tools to do data analysis are becoming easier. So there's plenty of tools out there. I'm not really going to talk about them. Uh, but uh, I guess the conclusion is that uh, the expert data scientist may be the person who's trained, trained strictly, strictly in data science um, will uh, remain rare. Now, of course, those people are still very helpful and, and, uh, and rubbing elbows with those guys. You know, like I said, I got some ideas from my son who is a data science expert. Uh, you know, it's definitely worth your while to, uh, you know, talk with these folks and, and interact with them. Uh, so I, I, I want to introduce a few analytics concepts and then, and then step in if we have time uh, to <clears throat> uh, some areas where you can implement some analytics in SQL, you know, just simple. That, that's a starting point for many people who already know Oracle, already know SQL. Uh, so some, there are some things that are concepts and these this of course obviously is not uh, uh, everything that you need to know but uh, there is this concept of feature engineering and feature selection and then schema on read methodologies so I'll talk a little bit about those uh, essentially with feature engineering this is where you're defining or creating the metrics that go into the model because some some metrics you can't use as is and you may need to do some calculations so for example a typical thing might be um, you're on, okay, you were on mute there, Rob. That's right. Um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, this is where you define or create the metrics that go into the model. So sometimes you need to calculate things. So for example, compute the the amount of time between two events, right? So you might have data for the two events, but you don't have the time between those events. So it requires some computation. Uh, feature uh, feature selection is uh, essentially where you're, it's called, it's about dimension reductionality. So in other words, when I have these 10,000 uh, metrics that are collected every 10 minutes and I'm analyzing a period over a couple of hours, um, I'm gonna have a lot of metrics to look at. So how do I focus on those metrics that are most important? That's where I sort of use the anomaly detection mechanism. But you can do anomaly detection in SQL or machine learning. There are definitely machine learning algorithms for that, but uh, uh, you could do sort of simple methods in, in SQL. Uh, schema on read methodologies, uh, and really the, we're, you're talking about just loading all the data and then establishing those data relationships after loading. So some of that might be feature engineering and some of that might be just uh, you know better defining or structuring that data for use. Um, and of course, relational databases, their schema on write, where you have to know the structure and the relationships of your data uh, in advance. So they're known in, in advance. You know, you have your customers, you have your uh, products, invoices, et cetera. Uh, analytics phases, this is interesting also because it helps sort of shed a little bit of light on uh, the different analytic capabilities. Uh, 
So a lot of uh, a lot of time is spent on data preparation, and uh, normally, uh, with in the case of database performance metrics, you know, the data is pretty clean, so I don't really spend very much time, but uh, on data preparation. But in other fields, you may need to spend a lot of time uh, cleaning up the data and gathering it. Uh, engineering features, in other words, uh, deciding uh, what variables are important to input into the model. So you'll spend some time on that. And then the actual, the modeling itself, and uh, that would include the feature selection. So reducing the metrics of uh, that are in of interest to your application. And then of course, you're generating insights from that. And that's really hopefully where you're going to get actionable business insights. So again, it's just uh, moves from data to the feature engineering, uh, to the modeling or the analysis, and then generating your insights. Uh, the, it's interesting to talk about the analytic levels because essentially three levels, descriptive analytics, predictive analytics, and prescriptive analytics. So with uh, descriptive, that's generally considered the lowest form. So what, what happened in the past hindsight, you're looking at uh, prior data uh, re and recognizing patterns in the data. Uh, with uh, predictive analytics, that's diagnostics or future you looking uh, using the patterns in the data. And then uh, with the prescriptive analytics, that's of the advising on possible outcomes. So that's where you're getting your highest value uh, business insights. Uh, there is a little uh, chart here which shows uh, uh, how those things sort of fit together. So essentially with prescriptive, you're letting the data generate the question for you. So with the descriptive analytics, that's kind of uh, the, the lowest level, but it, that is the most prevalent analytic solution. So that's pretty much where most statistical methods would uh, fit in descriptive analytics. And then predictive analytics, that's where you're gonna have your, a lot of machine learning. So that, in other words, what could happen. And then the prescriptive analytics at the top uh, right there, that's uh, uh, the highest area of interest uh, for companies, uh, the prescriptive analytics. And then this chart I'll just sort of put up here as a reference, but it, it, it's interesting because it shows uh, where and when and what kind of tools are used uh, for descriptive analytics, predictive analytics, and prescriptive analytics, and then when to use them. So it's just interesting to see how they sort of uh, lay out. Um, I did want to talk or give do a sort of a small jet tour of analytical capabilities of SQL because uh, you know I've been doing SQL for many years, uh, uh, but and a lot of these techniques uh, you know I'm using more recently in the past, let's say you know five or ten years type of thing. So let's do a quick uh, jet tour through the analytical capabilities of SQL. So uh, statistical analysis, we can generate normal ranges and we use those to identify abnormal values. And really that's just uh, something you may have learned in statistics in college or high school, uh, plus or minus two standard deviations from the mean, that's called the rule of thumb. And really it's just very simple um, statistical functions that you can use to um, calculate or a normal range. And the way that might look uh, uh, graphically, this is uh, a metric called current open cursor count. But if you see the graph there, the orange is the average value of that metric. And then the top line is plus two standard deviations from the mean. And the bottom line is minus two standard deviations from the mean. But those peaks above the line, those are your anomalies. So you can use this method to say, okay, any values above two standard deviations from a mean, I'll, I will consider anomalies and look into what's going on at that at that time. Oops, let me page up here. All right. Yeah, per, percentile count, uh, really that's just a percentile example. And we use percentiles to quantify the importance of a variable in a set. So for example, you might remember, um, uh, you know, being in a certain percentile when you took your SATs uh, for college, that type of thing. So uh, uh, that's how that's used. But it's actually also a very uh, simple function. And there's a query that you could run that goes against the uh, sysmetric summary. 
and uh, it would produce output that looks uh, something like this. And uh, and then you and then this like uh, 98th percentile or 99th percentile, you get to choose. You could say, well, that will be a cutoff. So I'll say any value for a period that is above the 98th percentile, I would consider an, an anomaly for this metric. So it's a it's an interesting way that you can uh, very quickly do anomaly detection with just a simple aggregate function. And you saw the query it was not very complex. Um, histograms hist uh, and uh, data dist or distributions. So they're very interesting because they can uh, they analyze the data value distributions within a variable. And typically you'll see bar charts uh, or other uh, histograms used to study data distributions. And uh, what Oracle does with a um, uh, function that they provide is sorting the, the data values into equal width buckets. And then they count the number of data points in each bucket. And there's the, the function call right there. Uh, there is a blog post uh, that you can get further information on, uh, but it's a, a simple query. So here's a, here's a query or an example of using that to give the a frequency distribution. And I was looking at logical reads per second uh, here. And, but the function is, uh, you know, fairly simple to uh, uh, program in there with a SQL statement. And then I could generate myself a graph with that, which is show the, uh, the orange line is the number of values in that bucket. And then the uh, blue line is the average value in that bucket. So you can see uh, that most of the data uh, is constant where most of the data is concentrated. Uh, another, um, well, again, this is to help you better understand the data distributions and each metric uh, in my in my field. You know, so there's remember I said tens of thousands of metrics. Pretty much everyone is going to have their own uh, data distribution. So it's interesting to see what those uh, values are. Uh, we can use correlation. And Oracle provides a correlation function, C-O-R-R, and that we use that to understand data value relationships between variables. Uh, it's very, very simple, but um, it, it will give me values between in the range of minus one uh, to one. And one means that there is a perfect correlation between these two metrics. So that means the values go up and down together. And zero is no correlation whatsoever. Uh, and uh, minus one is they're inversely correlated. So in other words, they would go in opposite directions, the values. Um, another link to if you want to get more information on the core function, but here's it in usage. So I'm really just doing a simple query against uh, sysmetric uh, history. So I have metric set one from sysmetric history and metric set two. And then I'm doing this correlation between uh, these two, the, the values. And it's essentially giving me a giant cross product of all metrics against all metrics, right? And then I'm gonna get, you know, depending on how many metrics are in that table, uh, it's going to give me, uh, you know, a pretty big output. But uh, so I did and just clipped some of that stuff out and you could see what the output would look like. Uh, that the top one is average active sessions in database time per second. Well, as it turns out, average active sessions is a, a workload metric and it's calculated from database time, which is how much time um, various SQL statements spent on CPU or waiting for CPU. Uh, so they so since average active sessions is calculated from DB time, we would uh, imagine that they would be perfectly correlated. Another one is, um, that I found interesting was the uh, CPU usage per transaction and response time per transaction. So as the CPU usage went up, then I got worse response time. So it's it's interesting to know, uh, you know, how these uh, metrics correlate. And then the ones down here at the bottom, uh, these are complementary metrics. So database CPU time and database wait time ratios they would add up to a hundred. Uh, so uh, you would expect them to be uh, perfectly uncorrelated. Uh, uh, so if, if, if I have a CPU time ratio, let's say of, of 65, and then I would have a database wait time ratio of 35. So they would both add up to 100. 
uh, uh, regression uh, is in interesting. The number of regression um, functions in Oracle, but with the regression slope, and you may remember from high school algebra, uh, that helps you analyze what direction the data values are going. Uh, so that's essentially producing the slope of a line. Are the values going up or down? And then also the magnitude of the scope of the change, so steeper slopes. A lot of other regression type of functions, but the regression slope uses a linear regression. And uh, I use it to find SQL that is uh, performing worse or better over time. Uh, and then I actually, I got the idea for that from Carlos Sierra. So look up his, uh, his uh, uh, SQL statement that he has for uh, regression using regression. Uh, but anyway, positive slopes that shows, would show that a SQL execution time is improving and a negative slope would show that a SQL execution time is regressing. Uh, let me see, I probably have a few others. Oh, the lag function. This one is really interesting because it's allowing me to look at the previous or the value for a, uh, a previous row. Uh, and, uh, and I use that to convert cumulatives to deltas. I use that a lot. Um, a number of Oracle metrics are persisted as cumulatives, but it's more interesting um, to see what the what the delta uh, between the variables are rather than the cumulative value. Uh, so, uh, uh, the if I was looking at I/O wait time, uh, the the change in value over a period is more important, or or the, sorry, the the I/O wait time for that period is more interesting than the cumulative wait time. Uh, another, uh, again, so lag is giving me the previous row in a table according to the order by, but it's very, very simple to use. Uh, the, the lead function allow me to see the next row and the value that in the table. Uh, I use that for inch, uh, feature engineering with dates. Uh, so the interval between date and times of an event are often more useful than the date time itself. I would imagine that Amazon well knows that uh, the time that between me or them presenting an ad in front of me and me purchasing it is very small. <laughs> uh, but that's uh, but the interval between a date and time of events is more uh, is useful than the date time itself. Uh, so in this case, uh, use case, I'm looking at the number of uh, seconds until the next execution of a query, and and it's really us a. a uh, not a very complicated um, uh, SQL statement, but I'm looking here at active session history and active session history will let me find the next execution because I have the execution times of all the queries and I can find the next execution time of a query. And uh, what I did here was um, I plotted uh, the seconds to the next execution of a query, which is the blue graph and then how long it took that query to run, which is the, the orange graph. And I could see these um, various uh, peaks and what they meant. Uh, this one, you know, where there was a long uh, time or duration between the next execution of a query, that was uh, the end of the day. So nobody was running this query at night. So it was run during a day by uh, financial analysts, let's say in this case. Um, and then in the uh, big high graphs here for how long it took to run the query uh, compared to the seconds to the next execution of the query. Those are bottlenecks because it took a lot longer. You can see on the left side, um, uh, it, the query ran faster than it was asked to, to be run. And now in this case, uh, the query is running slower, a lot slower than it was asked to be run. So those wound up being bottlenecks. So just some, some ways you can use uh, analytics with some examples of SQL code uh, to uh, solve problems, in my case, perform database performance problems. Uh, union and minus, I didn't want to uh, leave without saying a little bit about this because this one's been very, very helpful over the years and I use it to test data sets. So I would have, uh, you know, I have set A, which would be a query. And then sometimes that could be, um, like the, a starting query and now I've tuned this query and I've rewritten it and that would be set B. So now I have two data sets, uh, set A and set B. 
And if I run this query and it returns no rows, then these data sets are exactly equal. So I say select star from set A minus select star from set B. And I'm going to union the opposite of that, which is select star from set B minus select star from set A. If that, again, if that query returns no rows, then those data sets are exactly equal. Uh, so just uh, some interesting ways that you can uh, use uh, SQL for analytics. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is my last slide. Rob and I both work for Ancatech Data Engineering and really not our purpose to, uh, um, I guess, uh, plug for the company, but uh, uh, this is what uh, we're about. Rob has a book, uh, Application or uh, application security, Oracle database application security. I have a, a book which talks a lot about the anomaly detection uh, stuff, performance, uh, dynamic Oracle performance analytics, where I'm sort of assembling uh, the data dynamically that I want to analyze and then flagging out the anomalies. That was it in terms of like the, the formal slides that I had, Rob, but. Uh, All right, let's see if I can turn off my mute without uh, anything else going wrong. Um, let's see. Uh, there you are. And Assam is here. So uh, a couple things, uh, <laughs> analytics and big data. Um, one of the things that I keep coming across, and, and this is the hardest thing I have ever had to answer, what is the question? <laughs> and yeah. I know that sounds kind of stupid to people who haven't been around the block, you know, 30 or 40 times. But when I look at, you know, a, a data and also what's happening in the future, what's happening in our industry. Yeah, you know, and to me, my brain goes, "What is the question that I really need to answer?" And I, I keep coming back to, what skills are going to be really valuable in our industry? A year, five years, ten, twenty years down the road. Mm -hmm. Twenty years, you know, I'll I'll, I'll be in the uh, old folks' home. <laughs> um. But I keep coming up with three things. But you still might be using data. No, we'll still be. We'll still have data. <laughs> data science. Okay. Machine learning. I, I put machine learning, AI, natural language processing. I, I lump that all together. And it's actually four things: security and quantum. All right. I'm starting to see a lot more scientific papers coming out on quantum AI. It's not here yet. You're not going to see it in, within the re uh, a reasonable amount of time, or at least within my time frame before I retire, I don't think. But uh, I got a newsletter from uh, one of the quantum manufacturers, Q Systems. Was it Q? I can't remember the name off the top of my head. And they're working with another company that's coming up with quantum portfolio balancing. And it's a financial services company. So uh, that could be dangerous. <laughs> yes, I know. Especially tra trading in a, in a uh, time of... Uh financial volatility <laughs> yeah yeah but it was interesting you know it's like uh it, i got the uh q wave is the company is that the company mm. just a second nope i've closed it i closed that email uh q wave something like that i can't remember um but quantum you know start you know it, it, if you're younger than you know, us, uh, Roger and I, you may want to start digging into quantum. I'm already digging into quantum encryption, trying to understand it, because that's going to probably be on my desk be because I'm this, you know, working security. It's going to be on my desk before I retire. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to have to start dealing with it. Uh, you know, quantum encryption, it's a fascinating subject. 
you know, I'm going to dig more and more into that. Uh, but there's a lot of absolutely free resources on site online. Have you, uh, well, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure has the free tier where you can build yourself a, you know, a free um, cloud infrastructure. The, the services are limited. Okay, you're not going to bu yeah, build yourself a, a big rack or a bu big exadata system, but you, you get a reasonable amount of services with the live labs that Oracle offers. And those, yep. have, you, have you worked with the live labs yet? I've used some of the other uh, SQL labs, you know, where you could just go in and type SQL. And I don't have the link to that off the top of my head, but um, that that was uh, very useful because then you don't even have, you don't have to have Oracle anywhere and you could just go through a browser and start, mm -hmm. type, and start typing SQL. Well, uh, Google Oracle Live Labs. So if there is an Oracle product or a Oracle uh, or, you know, a technology within that, that stack, you have a lab where it will spool up a lab for you to use it for free to understand it. Mm -hmm. And hey. anytime, you know, I get a client call and says, hey, can you answer this question? You know, the first thing I wind up doing is I will go to live labs and see if I can, you know, it, it, it will spool up all the services. So I don't have to sit there and go into my sandbox, start building everything out manually, you know, to test the answer I'm going to give them. Mm -hmm. Okay. It'll bring all the services up. Okay. And you can go through the lab steps and, you know, me, sometimes I go through the lab steps, but a lot of times I'm just trying to figure something mm -hmm. out. Now, is that how you used it when you were uh, testing out the uh, various security options? Uh... Mm -hmm. that the table encryption table space encryption oh no 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 that, to, no that was, that, your, that was your own lab that's that's my own lab okay uh, uh i play in my own lab all the time mm -hmm. um and and i break it all the time uh, but the, <laughs> the, but the thing is i can break my lab okay mm -hmm. and, and it's really just a virtual box and with mm -hmm. VirtualBox, you can build your own little data center in your laptop. Mm -hmm. And so I do that all the time too. Um, but, you know, I, I'm using the live labs all the time. You know, it's like somebody asked me a question uh, a couple of weeks ago on Oracle database firewall. There's a database firewall, or it's audit vault database firewall live lab. And so, you know, it's like I go in, I spin up the live lab within my sandbox and I have the whole environment I need to test without having to go to the customer infrastructure. Yeah, and that sounds like that's an excellent thing to do if you do find yourself on the bench because now you don't have to have a, a great sort of deal of infrastructure in your own house or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, but, but you can uh, get experience with these things and, uh, and do the resume building. You know, mm -hmm. one, of the th one of the things, and I don't know if this is going in a slightly different direction, but, um, you know, just the idea of, of having a, uh, what I call a public living, breathing resume by mm -hmm. doing things like blogging and presenting, uh -huh. maybe be a book reviewer, those mm -hmm. kinds of things should look into Oracle ACE, um, expanding your, uh, contacts through LinkedIn, that type of thing, but having that leave living, breathing resume. So if you're learning something, document it, right? Well, yeah, it's going to, it's going to help you. And now you can take your documentation, you can turn it into a blog post. Yeah. And, uh, and then again, you, you're sort of building that living, breathing resume that people, people see. So it's not just, mm -hmm. okay, you know, Roger Cornejo looks on paper, you know, <laughs> so forth and so on, but people actually see your accomplishments, uh, mm -hmm publicly do you want to know why i started blogging years ago go for it <laughs> i write everything down on paper uh yeah i have a book just like that yep where'd you get it um i just order them by the oh, stack right. from amazon uh okay oh there we go Genesis. it's backwards <laughs> yeah um but i would be physically at a client and I'll go, I knew I saw this problem before. And it's in a book at my house. Mm -hmm. 
So I started <laughs> blogging. It's what I was doing was answering my own questions and putting them on the internet. That way, when I was at a <laughs> client site, I could go, oh, I'm just going to go over to my own stuff and answer my question because I was seeing you know similar things over and mm -hmm. over again. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yep. And uh, you know, it, and then it just went from there. It's like other people started reading it, and I'm like going, well, I better do a spell check now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have I have a problem with that too. <laughs> yeah, I got a big problem with spell check. Yeah, I don't want to lose my job over it though. That's for sure. No, no, neither do I. Um, that's kind of an inside joke. Um, but so, yeah, so yeah. So my yeah. So the encouragement there would be just you know put yourself out there and uh, you know most likely other people are going to see it. They may comment on it. They may not comment on it, mm -hmm. but it's, but it's out there and it's public. And, uh, and that becomes sort of like building your own sort of living, breathing resume. Well, then I also take my blog post and I link, put it, uh, in, into LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So it's like, Hey, read this. Yep. Exactly. Uh, and you have a lot of contacts there in LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So, so it's going to get a lot of eyes, you know, I actually mm -hmm. surprised because LinkedIn has metrics on that, you know, and sometimes you see, like you put something up and then you find out that uh, there were, you know, hundreds of eyes on it uh, yeah. in a very short period of time. So it's a great way of getting things out there. And sometimes thousands of eyes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, I've got a couple things. So you're more famous there. than I am. <laughs> yeah, I, I prefer infamous. infamous. <laughs> yeah. People, uh, the people who know me, know me. Uh -huh. So, yeah, and let, let's try to do this again next week. Let's see who we can invite to join us and uh, keep this conversation going. What do you think? Yeah, there. I mean, there's definitely a lot to talk about, you know, and some, you know, we, we were originally when I was kicking this diet idea around with Rob, we were talking about uh, graybeards getting together and telling war stories, you know, from from the tech trenches, uh, that type of thing. And a lot of this has to do with war stories, but really that was just about uh, getting together and sharing uh, war stories and, you know, using that sort of concept of iron sharpens iron, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that type of thing. And just uh, uh, encouraging one another. I know that uh, uh, some of these, uh, those war stories is, uh, there's a term that's used in the military. It's called stress inoculation training. Yes. <laughs> and and as you've been through the battles, right, that's mm -hmm. your stress, right? Um, uh, but uh, as you've you know, been through those stressful times on the job or wherever, uh, that helps you in your in your work, because now when something bad happens again, you know, another crisis that you're trying to solve, um, you've been through it before and it's not as stressful and you know mm -hmm. how and you know better how to deal with it. You know, some some people will you know, be panicking, running around like something's broken, something's broken. <laughs> and I'll be like, oh, that was really interesting. <laughs> Let's dig into it <laughs> and see if we can find out why. Yeah, and uh, absolutely. Uh, I've got, to, I, I remember early in my days, it was like, you know, something broke. I'm like, oh crap, I'm going to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm like, God, no, if, if something doesn't break, it means you're really not stretching. <laughs> It's just be careful where you break things. Yeah. Well, one of the funniest ones that I have when I when I broke something, um, I was uh, making some recommendations to a database, and some of those were parameters changes that require restart of the database. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we made the, the the system DBA made the parameter changes, and I was watching it. And then there was someone else from the application team who was actually testing it, and the parameter change actually destroyed the. Perf performance of the whole entire database. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, DB, so DBA said, uh, what should we do? I said, roll it back. <laughs> <laughs> roll back. <laughs> and he rolled it back, restarted the database. And uh, a couple of days later, I get this um, bronze service award in the email. You know, So the, the VP of, of the IT group that I was in found out that I had saved the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> on, this, on this database. But uh, little did she know that I actually broke the but, database first well you know that's <laughs> it's a minor detail yeah so i took my 250 dollar uh bronze service award and kept my mouth shut <laughs> well you know and i always tell that one little story where i brought the uh entire state department down including every embassy in the world because uh, <laughs> yeah, we're going way back statute uh, of limitations are over oh yeah the statute of limitations of stupidity is way over now 
Uh, a senior DBA said, run the script and log on as a DBA to run it. I logged on as sys. I was a brand new DBA. <laughs> what and other it, account did you have? <laughs> what other, yeah, that, I knew that password. And it truncated sys's tables. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> How fast did it take to break or to die? Um, to die? Was I like remember... Immediate? I remember watching the script running. I don't remember how long, but I just remember it. I started seeing sequence not found, sequence not found, sequence not found, <laughs> sequence not found, sequence not found, sequence not found. And I'm like, well, what's going on? And I call the senior DBA over and he's looking, he goes, well, what did you do? And I told him and I watched him and he was Persian. <laughs> and I watched him turn white as a sheet. <laughs> uh, He's like ashen gray. Oh yeah, ashen gray. It was like he was uh -huh. ready to. Uh, <laughs> he knew what happened, and then he explained it to me. And I called up Oracle support, and Oracle support said, "You can't do that." <laughs> well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I did. How do I, I undo it? But yeah. I guess I guess you had to rebuild it or something. Or yeah, we wound up having to you know call up the Unix group, mount the tapes, you know, restore uh -huh. the database. You know, the, mm -hmm. it, the restores took a lot longer back then. Uh huh. Yeah. This was seven dot oh seven dot one days, mm -hmm. and it was literally mount a tape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, this this one this one was uh, version five of Oracle. Mm -hmm. Once one SQL command crashed the entire database. Oh, I guess wow. I guess you could say it was two SQL statements. Uh, so I'm so I'm uh, I was deleting some data from like a five thousand row table, mm -hmm. no big deal. So I thought, well, I'll be nice. I'll lock the table. Mm -hmm. So I go lock table and shared update mode. No wait, semicolon return. Boom. Mm -hmm. Delete star from table. Semicolon return. As soon as I hit return, the whole database crashed. <laughs> and I was like, that was interesting. But it's lunchtime, you know, and uh, you really just go to lunch and come back. Hopefully, the database will be back. So Hopefully. go to lunch, chit chatting with everybody. I sit that back down in my office, you know, I'll stretch out like this. Huh? So then where was I? Okay, lock table and shared update mode. No wait, delete from table. And just before I, I had to hit the semicolon, and just before I hit return, I was like, you know, the last time I did this, database crashed, and I was like, nah, it couldn't be. <laughs> hit return, it goes boom, <laughs> goes out again, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, my boss comes into my office a few minutes later and says, I got the system uh, manager on the phone and he's saying, what did RDC 0208 <laughs> do to crash our computer? <laughs> uh, and at that time, this is a very long time ago, production and development was the same box. Oh, they okay. never did that. They never did that again. So I, not okay. only did I crash it for the developers, I crashed it for the entire company. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, so there were there are some good things you know to learn from that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, some good lessons. Um, yeah. um, I, I, and believe me, I've crashed enough systems in my life. Uh, that's how I got into security. It's like going, "Wow, I'm good at breaking things." <laughs> <laughs> Might as well do it for a living. <laughs> hey, pay me to do it. Pay me to break things. Um, <laughs> but yeah, let's see. We were. Um, Oh God, where was I? I was, I won't say the name of the customer. Um, I was in my office. I was the lead DBA, Oracle 7.2. All right. And I put a lot of effort into building a stable environment. It was so stable. It just constantly ran. It didn't break. And I remember I'm sitting, this is pre, you know, surf the web for, the news. <laughs> I, I, I had a private office. I'm leaning back in my chair. My feet are up on the table. And this is a government contract or up on the desk. And I'm reading the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> and the government PM comes walking by my office and looks in my office, goes, and I'm a contractor. Mm -hmm. What the blankety, 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 blank are you doing? And I go, I fold up my newspaper very properly, set it down, and I go, excuse me, sir. I am a very expensive insurance policy. <laughs> if you see me with my feet propped up reading the Wall Street Journal, 
it means you do not have a problem. <laughs> if you see me hunched over my keyboard with sweat coming out, it means you have a problem. And that's what you pay me for. <laughs> and since then, when the government PM would walk by my office, look in, go, okay, <laughs> have a good day. Hey, you know, he, he understood what a good SA is, a good systems administrator mm -hmm. has set things up that it's like, you know, you build enough automation into the system that, you know, it, it warns you. I had a little dashboard that I coded that, you know, mm -hmm. gave me all the important metrics if something were, were to go haywire, I'd, you know, know where to look. And from that point on, I stayed on that contract for 14 years. <laughs> uh, they, they liked it. That's good. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's because it didn't, uh, when it broke, it got fixed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that must have brought you up to about version 10 or 11 of Oracle. <clears throat> when I left From version when, seven, for 14 years. when I left, it was 11.1. Okay. Yeah, 11.1. Interesting. So, and then I went to some place that was not near as much fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, fun. Fun is uh, is good to have fun, and you know, a couple of things that I would say in terms of your people who are still employed, it would be, uh, you know, carve out time to mm -hmm. explore things because oh, yeah. nobody's nobody's going to carve it out for you. Oh yeah. And, and uh, uh, so carve out time, build your bag of tricks. You know, the the things that help you do your job. Like I'm sure Rob has a a nice bag of tricks, and just mm -hmm. uh, save that. You know, even you know, archive it. Uh, put it put it somewhere where it's accessible publicly, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Um, yep. So all those are, those are good things to do. Yep, they are. Well, Roger, thank you. Let's set this yep. up again for next week. Uh, I'll touch base tomorrow and we can discuss it. All right. Yep, sure. All right. Yep. Listen, thanks, guys. Have a good evening. All right. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.